Welcome to the biggest geese test for mead that's ever been done. Today we're testing 20 geese using one basic mead recipe. The mead recipe we're using today is a traditional mead that has orange blossom and carrot blossom honey. My honey ratio is three quarter orange blossom honey and one quarter carrot blossom honey. This test is pretty simple. I started by using this recipe on screen and mixed up 10 gallons of must. I then split that must into 20 one half gallon containers and prepared my yeast. The starting gravity for each must is 1.085. My yeast were all rehydrated with GoFirm. For nutrients, I'm giving each yeast the required amount of nutrition. Each yeast has a different required amount of nitrogen and nutrition in general. To find this information, I had to scour through the white pages of each yeast. Each falls into either a low, medium, high, or super high nutrient requirement. I then plugged that information into a mead making nutrient calculator and prepared the right amount of nutrients for each yeast. You can see that information on the screen. I am using a combination of Fermate O, Fermate K, and DAP. At the 24 hour mark, I added the required Fermate O to each yeast. And then at the 48 hour mark, I added my Fermate K and Dimonium Phosphate. I made it basically a tiny bag for each yeast and just kind of it's like a lunch box for them. You generally want to avoid adding DAP within the first 24 hours. I did not want to follow a full staggered nutrient schedule for each brew because that would be insane to do for 20 meads. Sorry, Reddit. I'm also fermenting each yeast in its median temperature range. I found out which yeast could ferment at my house's ambient temperature, which is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit and then broke the rest into two groups. One group needed to ferment at about 82 degrees Fahrenheit, the other about 76. I set uh, the meads on heat pads in hopes to help them reach their temperature and had a nice little setup. The goal of this test is to see what different characters each yeast brings to this simple brew. After these are done fermenting, I'll be putting them back to clear and age for a while. I will be doing a big tasting and deciding which yeast myself and a group of friends likes the most, Obviously, yeast can do better in some different circumstances and recipes, so this is not a, quote, greatest yeast of all time video. Rather, it's going to showcase some interesting notes about each one. The primary fermentation took about two to three weeks for all of them to finish. We saw the yeast start to flocculate at the bottom for each one, and of course the bubbling stop. We took a gravity reading for every one of them. The starting gravity was 1.085, and the final for each was 1.000. So that means that the total ABV for each is right here. Because they all went dry, I, I think that's a good thing for this test. We didn't have to deal with any balancing issues with that. We decided to go through the laborious task of racking each into a new container. So that's what I did. I racked with auto siphon and tubing into a new container, made, made sure to label them all correctly to not get anything confused. And we let them set for a little bit just to kind of chill out. I thought this test would be more interesting with a little sweetness, so I went ahead and stabilized each one of these with the same dose or dosage of potassium metabisulfite and potassium sorbate. Now we can safely back sweeten these brews so we can have a little bit of sugar there. I didn't want to back sweeten to the point where it was going to be distracting from the yeast character, but I figured a dry mead tasting might be kind of tough with this. After we stabilized and let them set for about a week, we back sweetened with some more orange blossom honey. It was roughly about a quarter pound of orange blossom honey per container. The final gravities for every single one, because I added the same amount of honey and just made sure to do all this right, is 1.010. So they're all the same uh, final alcohol content and they're all the same final gravity. We let them set for a while longer and it was time for us to move on with them. We needed to go ahead and bottle them. So I bottled every single one. I got about three beer bottles and a 187 milliliter of each one. We labeled them and we put them in boxes so that we could let them set for the big tasting at the year mark. At that year mark, I decided I wanted to share this with a couple different groups. So I shared a box with some friends up in the Minneapolis area and they did a, a tasting event there. And then the Mead Stampede crew, we all did, all 16 of us did a big tasting um, as well. Everybody completed a Google form, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. These meads are a year old, and I think it's very interesting. This video and the rest of this video is a lot of information. There's some YouTube chapter markers if you wanna know specific things. 
um, or specific information. But my hope is that you're gonna figure out some fun facts about these yeast, what they are best used for, and all of that information you've really been looking for when choosing a yeast. I think it's time for us to get into the tasting notes and all of the great information about this. All right, here we are for the grand tasting. This year long, over year long process uh, requires one thing, and that is I gotta open some mead because this has been a long time coming. Now I'm not gonna talk about the taste of this mead because that really doesn't matter. You're here for the 20 different mead recipes tastes that we had a moment ago. So I'm gonna talk about that here. This mead is about the same age as all of these other ones and it also used carrot blossom honey. So one of the interesting things about this whole experience is that the combinations of honeys that I used, being orange blossom and carrot blossom, uh, left me with a very interesting traditional mead. Carrot blossom is very spice heavy. You get a lot of these subtle or really prominent baking spices around and this thing has a ton of spices. You almost think that it's a methaglin based off that, but it's not. So. That kind of uh, played into some interesting results when it came to the scoring and everything. This whole little section here, I'll tell you right now, is gonna be a little bit long. This part of the video is gonna be explaining results. Um, towards the end, I'm gonna talk about each yeast in specific and tell you what they're good for. I have spent a lot of time on a bunch of notes. You can find this big old notes link down below, but I'm super excited to share this whole experience with you. So let's get started. Alongside me getting to taste this stuff, um, I had 18 other people who came through and basically did a great job of just giving me notes on all of these meads. And so basically what happened was I sent out some mead and then also hosted a big mead tasting event and had everybody complete a Google form. Each form had the mead number that they were tasting. They didn't know what yeast was what. So they basically tasted everything in a blind fashion. They told me a score out of 50 to help me give a, a rating or a gauge. And then they also gave me some tasting notes. So you'll see that in a couple different forms down below and then some things on screen as we go through. But all 18 people and 19, including myself, we went through and tasted these and gave our notes. And that's where all of this data is coming from. So let's go for it. Again, shout out to all of those people who helped me with the tasting. They're on the screen right now. I appreciate you greatly. You are super helpful to this channel and you have helped me um, get through a large challenge in my life. So on my form or on this doc that you might be looking at right now, or you might be seeing some on screen, I have separated everything out into their different yeast brands. So I have Safel yeast and various other yeast, which include the Safel SO4, US05, Saf Cider AB1, Mangrove Jacks MO5, and Bread Yeast. That's one little clump. I put all of the Lauvin products together. I put all of the Red Star products together on this form. And then I also put all of the Kvaik strains together on this form. I'll show you a quick little picture of what this looks like. Essentially, I went through the tasting on that big Google sheet and they all gave me their tasting notes for each one. And I used ChatGPT to help me consolidate those tasting notes down into a smaller format. There's a big format that you're seeing on here, which they talked about aromas and flavors and things they perceived. So this is all of that information you'll see for what they tasted. If you're interested in that, again, there's a lot of descriptors there, so it might be overwhelming to read, and I've made a shorter version of each one. Now, before I just go ahead and talk about all of the descriptors for each thing, essentially, I'm gonna go ahead and do this in a reverse order. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you how things scored. This data is useful for traditional meads, and I do think that the fact that we had orange blossom and carrot blossom honey added a little complexity, just, just to be clear, just to be honest with you. So if you see these results, they might, might not always be true because some yeast might do better with high, well, high floral things, but also highly spiced sorts of honeys. So this is just the results for this combo, but I do feel like it's pretty valuable and you might be shocked by the results. Here are the scores for each one. There's a, I'm showing you a, a shorter thing first and then I'll show you the top 20, how they actually ranked. But what's happening here is we have a high score, the highest score received for each one of these things and then the lowest score. So here's all the judges scoring side. Now, 
I've compiled it a little bit. What, you'll, what you're seeing right here is per judge, what the highest score they gave and the lowest score. We have a maximum and a minimum score. Of course, there's the differences for the scores be between each one. You might notice that there's a pretty uh, wide swing. Some judges were up to you know 40s in their highest, and then they went all the way down to the 20s for their lowest. So not that that says, I mean, well, that their experience was different and they tasted things, but it's very interesting nonetheless. Now, math-minded people will have a bunch of other variables that they would like me to plug into this Google Sheet, and I, uh, I'm not a math person, so I apologize. So here's what you've been waiting for. The final score is the top scoring, the bottom scoring. You can see in first place, which is a very interesting one, and we'll talk about it, um, the Red Star QVA scored the highest average score out of all 19 judges. So first place was Red Star QVA. Second place is the Sapphire US05, it's a beer yeast commonly used. Third place is the Mangrove Jacks M05. Fourth place, I'm not gonna say all of these, but you can kind of see on the screen right now all of these different scores. And the lowest, which I thought was interesting, was Kvike Hornendal, which I, I like for a lot of meads. Again, if you see a, a yeast on here that's scoring low for their traditional, and you've had a better experience, let me know down below. But this is just based off this one thing. So anyways, highest first place we got here, pretty close first and second place and third place. Um, there was a tie for third place, as you can see, and then all the way down to 20th place. We are not using every yeast possible. There are a bunch of yeast I missed. So if you're already typing a comment about how I missed the uh, DV10 yeast or something like that, um, I, I know, I'm aware, but I, I did what I could. What I gather from this right here is that surprisingly the cuvee yeast being a champagne sort of yeast that goes up to 18 percent it acts a lot like the lalvin ec1118 which is normally not something you do or use for traditionals did really well and that might just be the yeast strain itself the ec1118 was way further down tied for 11th place and they're kind of in that same strain so obviously red star red star has its own little um yeast style and characteristic there that is interesting. And then of course we have a beer yeast in second place, the Safel US 05, which is something that's normally a lower alcohol by volume tolerance and you just don't always equate for a traditional mead. I think we're, we're not doing enough with this yeast. Mangrove Jacks M05, a notable mead yeast. Safel SO4 in, in third place, tied for third. Another beer yeast. Red Star is really cleaning up here. You'll notice that the first time we see a, a, a Lalvin product is in sixth place with the Lalvin D47, which a lot of people also don't really like because of its temperamental temperature range. It's interesting. And then the middle of the pack, also a fun one, is bread yeast. All right, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna read a little bit of information about from the tastings of each one. There's a lot of descriptors here, and again, I use ChatGPT to help me kind of compile these and make them more approachable. So you'll see, I'll show you again, a little picture of all of the descriptors, and then it broke it down into a paragraph. So let's talk about specifically first, we're gonna go down in my order, like I said. This is the Safel S04. Here's what they noted from the specific tasting. Now let's talk about, based off of that experience, what they noted, and the manufacturer's recommendations for each yeast. I'm gonna tell you what each brew is best for. So right now, the Safel S04, based off those things, the best brews for it are American and English ales, highly hopped brews, and cask conditioned, conditioned brews. This says the Safel S04 produces fruity and floral notes, so I think you should use this for bright, well, based off that data, you should use this for bright fruit melamos, traditionals, and in, uh, and in general, braggots. Here are the yeast specs on screen, so you can see them right here. This is all the information you need to, you need to know about the Safel SO4. All of these will be chaptered on YouTube, so if you wanna jump through and find specifically, I'm looking for this yeast, here's that. At the very end, I have a composite list of all of the brews 
all the different styles of mead and then what yeast fit well for them. And you can find that, um, well, you can find that in the link below. I'll talk about that. Here's the Safel US05, another beer yeast. They said, the brews that I believe this yeast is good for, um, and based off of, again, all the data from the, the manufacturers and such, uh, traditional meads, hopped meads, lots of mellow mels. I think it's pretty wide, uh, widely capable of fermenting well in most fruit meads. It's a pretty even fermenter all around that retains a lot of characters post-fermentation. And here are the yeast specs for it. You'll notice this has a lower alcohol tolerance. There was a list of attenuation, which normally means how much sweetness is left. However, honey normally gets fermented up. And then of course the temperature range. Here's the saff cider yeast. I thought this one would be fun to run into the mix. The brews this is best for is best for sweet and dry ciders from fresh or concentrated apples, uh, suitable for difficult fermentation conditions and mixes with sugar syrups. So sizers and malic fruits are your best bets for that. The yeast specs are right here. I couldn't find a lot of information on this, like an alcohol uh, tolerance. I couldn't figure that out and I looked all over. You'll notice that there is a nitrogen requirement. That's your, your yeast nutrition that you wanna watch out for. Mangrove Jack's M05 mead yeast. Here are the notes. You'll notice they talk a lot about apple there. So the uh, yeast itself was providing some of that apple side, which is kind of fun for mangrove. The spec sheet is not great, but this is what the manufacturer and everyone I've kind of talked to suggested. They said, this yeast is pretty similar to a champagne yeast in its ABV, ABV tolerance. So quick fermenter for high alcohol fermentations. It would do well with traditionals in some circumstances, but also does well with neutral brews because it doesn't really provide a lot of uh, esters. This brew has a little more esters presented than that EC1118, but I don't know that it is as prominent. Here are the specs for the Mangrove Jacks M05. Next up, we have our friend Bread Yeast. Bread yeast is kind of an anomaly here, and uh, there's not a, a manufacturer's guidelines to say like use it well for these brews. I, I didn't really characterize and say in my end results what it's best for. I think you can use it for a variety of things. I don't know if it's the best choice though. Same thing for the specs. There's not really any specs as far as alcohol tolerance, flocculation, um, temperature range. It's all kind of varied based off of your bread yeast you're using. Now we move on to the Lauvin products. We have the Lauvin EC1118, notably a champagne yeast. Lots of people say don't use this yeast for traditionals, and I'll let the big score sheet kind of speak to that. But here's what they tasted. <laughs> So in my opinion, and based off what I've seen, this yeast is probably best for uh, neutral fermentations, champagne strength things, um, doesn't really add a lot of yeast character. One thing that's fun about this, and I'll show it in a moment, is that there is a little graph that talks about flavors and the esters that might be uh, provided by said yeast. So EC1118 has, has done well for me for uh, berry meads and anything that's really strong flavored in my opinion. It often will blow off a lot of characters. So light flavors, delicate honey, it's not stuff you wanna use. Here are the yeast specs, specs, including that flavor and aroma wheel. You'll notice it's pretty lame. It only really has mineral filled out and that's because this yeast itself does not really provide a lot of esters. It ferments. That's the goal. It's literally just to do the job, get yourself to 18%, get a wide fermentation range with low nutrients. It's interesting. Next up, we have the Lauvin D47. Here are the tasting notes. This uh, mead is best for specifically with the D47. This one is best for malolactic fermentations tropical citrus fruits, big mouthfeel brews that does well with high ABV brews in general, 
dark berry fruits, according to some experience I read online. Um, and based off the manufacturers, they said this yeast is recommended to be used with Chardonnays and large barrel bodied brews uh, because of the release of polysaccharides into the must that contribute a round soft palate with good weight. So if you want something that has a big body, D47 might be your friend. Here are the yeast specs and a flavor aroma wheel for you to check out. You see that the alcohol tolerance is 15%. You can kind of go past that, of course. It's got a lot of mouthfeel and tropical fruit, stone fruit, citrus, um, white flowers. That's all filled out there. So super interesting for trying fun brews. Next up, we have the Lauben 71B, a notable yeast in our world. Here's what they said. That's a lot of descriptors there. I've kept them all in, by the way, because every tasting experience is valuable. So if you notice, it's a lot of things. This is everything those judges said. I didn't start cherry picking out and saying, well, I didn't perceive this, so that's not true. This is everything all 19 of us perceived. Brews that this yeast is best suited for. Um, I'm gonna read first off of the manufacturers to talk about it some. This says the Lauvin 71B has the capacity to absorb phenolic polyphenolic compounds on its cellular wall, which limits tannin structure in young and of young and fresh red wine. Grape must inoculated with 71B will easily go through malolactic fermentation as 20 to 40% of malic acid can be metabolized by this yeast, uh, by the yeast strain during primary fermentation. This yeast is a perfect choice to create young, fresh and fruity red, rosé and white wines that are easy to drink. It's also a great choice for late harvest wines. So that malic acid um, fermentation and metabolizing is something that's important. You don't really wanna use this for sizers or stuff that's high malic acid if you want that acid profile to be prevalent. Here are the things I'd suggest it for. Um, dark berry brews, red fruits. I think piments could go well here. Um, I would say that you might stray away from the uh, traditional side. It doesn't seem like it's doing so hot with traditionals all the time, but those kind of mellow male styles seem to do well. Even like Bochets, I think it does well. Here are the yeast specs for it. With that flavor and aroma wheel, you'll see lots of red fruit, lots of ester, because that's what it puts off, a lot of flavors there. Stone fruit, tropical fruit, some white flowers, kind of an interesting little spec right there. Next up, we have the Lauvin BM 4x4. This yeast is really good for dark berry brews, including blueberries, elderberry, black raspberry, blackberries, all those things, uh, etc. It's not great for lighter fruits, like peaches, pears, apples, and those. It's also not great for traditionals, in my experience, um, but there's a big old paragraph here that talks about the differences between 4x4 and its friend, BM45. I'll let you read that if you want to. There's a lot of talk about polysaccharides, which is essentially a, uh, where a lot of those tannins come from. So you gotta, well, if you want something that has more mouthfeel, you gotta watch out for that. Here are the yeast specs on it, of course. There's not a flavor graph for this one, unfortunately, but it is a high ABV and a high nutrient needing yeast. So keep that in mind. Next up, we have the Lauvin QA23, notably used in tropical fruits. People have had great success in some trop in, uh, traditional meads, light fruit meads. The kind of cliff notes of what this little paragraph says, I see some stuff, uh, all the same things as before but low toffee, apple, banana peel, pithiness, citric notes. There's some bitterness, uh, a little butteriness, according to some people. This says the overall experience is balanced and clean with a moderate warming sensation. This yeast is best for tropical fruited meads, bright citrus fruits. It's not great for traditionals. Um, I have had good success with more, uh, I don't wanna say delicate flavors, but like that, it really, uh, propels the citrus side and you'll see that with the yeast specs right here you can see all that fermentation range alcohol tolerance 16 percent um, the competitive killer factor is if you introduce it with another yeast and it can overpower that yeast it will it's they they like to fight and malolactic bacteria compatibility so that 
the malolactic fermentation side is very achievable with this. But you notice that flavor and aroma, high tropical fruit, high citrus, and high mineral. Two more uh, Lauvin products. We have the Lauvin Borgavin RC212. I'm gonna read about this yeast. This says the Borgavin RC212 has been isolated in Burgundy in the Burgundy region of France by the Burrow Interprofessionnel des Vin uh, something for its ability to highlight the Pinot Noir grape uh, variety qualitative potential, especially in regards to the polyphenols. Thanks to its limited cell wall polyphenol absorption, this yeast promotes color and tannin stabilization during fermentation. This makes this yeast a perfect choice to ferment grape varieties such as Pinot Noir, Grenache, and Zinfandel with delicate structure, ripe cherry, bright fruit, and spicy character. So I would suggest to use this for um, stone fruit like cherries, bl uh, dark berries, blueberries, some pears and peach brews. I think it will be interesting for that. It promotes a lot of bright fruity characters. So, and the tannin structure. So if you want something that has more chew, mouthfeel. Here is the whole spec sheet for it. That aroma wheel has a lot of stone fruit, red fruit, spicy, mineral side. So think about that. Our last love and yeast is the K1V1116, which I have used a lot. I find this interesting about this yeast. It says when fermented at low temperatures and with the right addition of nutrients, uh, this yeast is, is one of the best at producing the most floral esters with a bunch of interesting things. The esters bring fresh floral aromas um, to neutral varieties of high yield grapes. So that's kind of fun. This is best used for highly floral brews, stone fruits, mango cherry, etc., red fruits and tropical fruits. In my personal experience, I use this for my sizers actually. I use this as one of my base um, yeast for my sizer recipe that I like, my apple cinnamon. Here are the yeast specs, of course. You see that red fruit uh, doesn't really talk about tropical fruit or anything like that, but it does have some stone fruit and some white flowers. It's a pretty solid yeast. It's also a high strength ABV. We're moving on to Red Star. This is the Red Star Cuvée. This yeast, this yeast is another champagne strain, but it's recommended from the manufacturer for reds, whites, and champagnes. It's pretty neutral, so it won't give a lot of yeast character. This yeast does a pretty good job at retaining honey character in trads, traditionals, and uh, balancing most fruit characters in general. So I would honestly say it's pretty versatile, not only from your like traditional standpoint, but you could use it for dark fruits, bright fruits. Um, I think you have a wide range spectrum to brew with this one. Here's the specs on screen. There is no flavor aroma wheel, unfortunately, for this one. We have the Red Star Premier Blanc next. This yeast is best for brews that have a neutral flavor profile. It's recommended for dry whites, Cabernet, cider, fruits, meads, ports, and sodas. This brew is recommended for dry brews because of the clean esters and aromas that it presents. I would recommend using this in traditionals. Brighter fruit meads, it's also good for higher ABV brews, but not carbonated brews. They were spe specific to talk about that. Here's the specs on it. It is a high ABV brew, low uh, nitrogen needing. You can plug that into your uh, yeast nutrient calculator when it says low, medium, or high. We got a Red Star Rouge up next. This brew encourages development of varietal fruit flavors balanced by complex aromas when using grape and Cabernet uh, family grapes. It's also good for grapes picked early, which I find interesting. We don't really do that much on our set, our side. I would use this for lots of piments, actually. I think it would be interesting to do that. Um, it does seem to do well with things that are methaglins or honestly some fruit aromas and flavors as well. So most melomels. Here are the yeast specs, of course. Medium nitrogen kneading. So again, factor that into your brewing. Next up, we have the Red Star Cote de Blanc. I'm saying that wrong, sorry. So this one has a lot more 
or warm fruit character, which I find interesting. So you might get like a, it, might, it seems like it takes the bright fruit characters and kind of squashes them and makes them more mellow. Also known as Gesenheim Epernay, a low foaming, slow speed fermenter with low alcohol tolerance, the strain emphasizes fruit character in both reds and whites, making it an excellent choice for fruit wines, especially apple. It's great for ciders, according to this. Uh, if fermented at cooler temperatures, it will not ferment to dryness, producing a sweeter wine with some residual sugar. So I would use this for sizers, for pears, for peaches, other bright fruits like, th like that. I would stay away from dark berries, anything in that world. I think that those are kind of your categories. Here's the yeast specs, of course. No flavor graph, unfortunately. Next up, we have the Red Star Classique. Also known as UCD number 522, this is a strong fermenter with a good alcohol tolerance that is useful in producing dry, full-bodied red and white wines. It will leave a wine with intense color and excellent flavor complexity while preserving tannin content. This yeast will produce hydrogen sulfide gas in the presence of excess sulfur compounds and therefore should not be used to ferment grapes that contain residual sulfur dust. It doesn't really affect us too much unless you're making piments. It says it's great for dry meads. I would also use this for your piments, of course, as we just talked about. Um, I don't know that I would use this much for traditionals, but it does seem to do okay. Here's our spec sheet. This has a great range for temperature fermentation. You got 59 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty wide, 15% ABV and medium nitrogen kneading. We've got our last three yeasts. They're all Kvike strains, which generally, I'll go and spoil for you, when I fermented these, I tried to go at a higher temp, but I didn't go at the extremes. Um, if you note, some Kvike yeast like to ferment at 95 degrees Fahrenheit or above. We didn't ferment that hot. Kvike strains at those temperatures will generally put off different esters, and those esters are, are highly desirable. Also, the fermentation speed increases, generally speaking, but Kvike strains are well known for their wide a temperature range that allows for lots of fun characters. Our first Kvike strain is the Hornendal. Here's uh, information about the yeast. This is a wonderfully unique Norwegian Kvike. Hornendal's blend of cooperative strains produce a tropical flavor and complex aroma that can present as stone fruit, pineapple, and dried fruit leather, which complement fruit forward hops. Add even more dimension to C hops and increase ester intensity with a high fermentation temperature, as we talked about. Here are the, all the specs about them. Again, that high fermentation range, we stayed there, and the high uh, alcohol tolerance. It talks about attenuation, because it's a beer yeast kind of, and flocculation. All Kvike strains need a lot of nutrients though, so just know that it's high nutrient needing. Next up, we have the Lutra. It's a notably clean fermenter. Here's information about it. Isolated from our Hornendal Kvike, uh, Lutra is shockingly clean with unrivaled speed uh, when pitched at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. This strain is perfect for brewing an even more neutral and refreshing pseudo lager at its lower temperatures without lead time or other lager yeast. Lutra is a worry-free way to navigate the evolving demands for cold ones. I would use this in traditionals, melomels, most any mead, same thing for the last one. With the Hornendal, it is a good, clean fermenter in a lot of ways. Use it for your melomels, use it for bright fruit melomels, traditionals, hopped meads, braggots. Honestly, there's not a lot of styles that the Hornendal um, or the Lutra can't do well. And the last one, Kvike Voss. This one is notably, uh, when you ferment at high temps, you are gonna get more citrusy notes, and that's what they talk about here. We have some orange, peach, passion fruit, citrus, herbal nuances, some of those things there. There's a big thing talking about it right here. I'm just gonna put it on screen. This brew is great for citrus-based brews because of the orange and citrus notes that are achieved at higher temps. It's also an overall great fermenter for most any fruit or traditional. Again, the Kvike strains are pretty darn clean and I would use them kind of for a wide variety of things, but specifically if you're aiming for those higher temps, higher, uh, orange pithy side, you might get that. Again, here are the yeast specs. Look at that temperature range, 77 degrees Fahrenheit to 104. 
very high flocculation. This thing burns through everything and there is a flavor aroma for this one wheel. So you can see it on screen. It says neutral and tropical fruit as the main ones. All right, so we've reached the end. If you survived this long, thank you so much for sitting through all those things. I know that's a lot of tasting notes and I'm trying to consolidate them down. I hope that I've given you some information. Here are the composite lists of these yeasts specifically and the different styles that I think they go best for. So we can see traditionals up here and sizers and light fruit melomels, pear peach, similar fruits, citrus fruits, dark berries, braggots, bochets, white piments, red piments. It's all on screen. This is a list compiled based off the manufacturer's information, what they suggest, what I found in my experience, what I found in other people's experience as they suggested to me. There will be a uh, Google Drive link below to this list that might be updated. I'm gonna try and keep this updated over time. So if you're watching this a year from now, it might be updated with new information. I would love to fill this whole thing out with more than the 20 geese that were featured in this video. It'd be fun to do this for, uh, I mean, all the yeast I can find and just kind of talk about, ooh, I, I really think the <laughs> DV10 is a really good brew for red piments and I throw that in there. So this can be a comprehensive list for you. So that's all of those what's good for what. I hope you've enjoyed um, that long process to get here. This test has taken over a year, been a ton of work, but I'm so thankful for all the wonderful people who helped me in the tasting. And it's been a lot of work for me, but I've enjoyed it. There's a ton of Google Doc stuff below um, with this huge list I've been reading off of. If you're someone who's interested to read everything I've said and talk about it, you can just look at it. And it has all of that stuff with scores. I'm sure somebody likes the statistical side to read all of those things. Have I hit every single yeast that I could use? No, there's hundreds of yeast. If I've learned anything from the t this test, it is the tasting was really tough. There are subtle differences between every single yeast. You noted and we noted here that there's a lot of similar tasting notes with subtle things there. When you're tasting 20 things back to back that are like almost the same, it's kind of like those picture books where you're like spot the difference between the photos. After you do that for a long time, your brain starts to have some trouble. So thank you to my tasters for going through that process. But um, I don't know if I'll do this again as a big one. 20 yeast has been a pretty good cap and I think we've got some good comprehensive data. So I'm sorry if I didn't get your yeast uh, in the list, but I've enjoyed getting to do this and the best thing you can do to support the channel with a video like this that takes so long is hit that like button because holy cow, this has taken forever. Um, it also costs a fair amount of money if you'd like to support via the Patreon or YouTube membership. It's just an easy way to help, help keep the channel running, but liking and of course subscribing. If you're not subscribed to the channel and you made it this far, you should really hit subscribe because I'd love to see you. So check out all those links Thank you for watching. This has been a long video, but I'll see you in the future with a different thing. See you then.